Uh, If you would, please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 will be in verses 10 and 11 today. Um, While you're turning there, I want to say thank you to all of you who so faithfully prayed for some dear saints in our church this week who are all going through some very serious health-related concerns. Um, For Tom Scott, for Carol Lindgren, for Dwayne Bergeson, you all demonstrated a level of faithfulness, trust, and hope in the Lord that was a blessing to me and instrumental in the lives of Tom, Carol, and Dwayne. Uh, James 5, 15, and 16 says, the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. What a joy it is to stand here today and to say that both men are doing very well after heart surgeries. And a woman in her 90s is doing well after battling COVID and pneumonia. So thank you for praying. Thank you for trusting the Lord with our brothers and sister in Christ. If you're on our email prayer chain, you are aware of all of these issues and developments uh, this week, if you're not on that email chain, I would strongly encourage you to join us, and uh, you can indicate that you would like to be on your connection card. Just simply provide an email and say, hey, I want to be on the prayer chain, and drop it in the box in the back uh, before you head out today. Um, well, as we continue, I wanted to briefly reflect upon what we learned last week. Um, last Sunday, we considered the joy of knowing Christ. We learned that being reminded of truth is a good thing. That leads us to a deeper knowledge of Christ and guards us against false ways of understanding our relationship with him. And when I say false ways of understanding our relationship with him, I mean thinking and believing that there are works that I must perform in order to be finally acceptable in his sight. In Paul's day, some held to the notion uh, that in order to be finally acceptable, you must also submit to the law and be circumcised. Or we learned that good works... Um, that I have done are something worth boasting about and would make me righteous in God's sight. Those aren't things that make us righteous in God's sight, those good works, um, and they're nothing worth boasting about. What we learned is that both ways of thinking, whether gaining righteousness through the law or thinking that there are things that we have done that we can boast about before the throne, are completely futile in saving us from our sin. Rather, it is only through believing by faith in Jesus and his work on our behalf that we receive from God a righteousness that is not our own, a righteousness extra nos, a righteousness from outside ourselves, a righteousness that the text said depends on faith. This is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That is, the believer in Jesus is justified or counted righteous or declared to be righteous before God, not based on anything that they have done or any personal merit that they might claim, but on the grounds of the perfect and finished work of Jesus in the sinner's place. If you have turned from your sin and you've entrusted yourself completely to the person and work of Jesus as your only hope, to be accepted before the throne of God, then you have been justified. God has credited the perfect righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus, to you as a gift. You've been saved by grace through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God so that no one can boast in themselves, but only, rather, in his grace and mercy shown to us in Christ. Today, as we move into the text of Scripture, we're only going to be looking at two verses. It's part one of a two-part message on what is referred to as sanctification. Sanctification, the title of the message today is The Joy of Sanctification, part one. And as we make our way into the text of Holy Scripture, uh, would you pray with me? Father, what gifts of grace our justification and sanctification. To know that we stand fully justified and accepted in your sight based on the finished work of Christ. What a marvelous gift of grace that is. So Lord, today our hearts and our minds exalt and boast in the finished work of Jesus. And Father, may we understand and the more deeply we understand our justification 
May it help us to move onward into sanctification. May we grow up in Christ. May we more, grow more deeply in our understanding of who you are and all of the benefits and blessings that are ours in the gospel. And in doing so, it would change the way that we live. For everyone in this room, that each and every day our lives would be being brought more into conformity with the likeness of Christ Jesus to the praise of your glorious grace. Help us to see the joy that is in growing in holiness, the joy that is in becoming more like Jesus as we look into your word today. Teach us that by the power of your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The joy of sanctification. The joy of sanctification. What do we mean when we use the term sanctification? There really are two parts to this doctrine. Um, Those who are in Christ are positionally set apart. That's the first part of this doctrine. As a Christian, you are a saint. That is your position in Christ. You've been set apart. You are positionally holy. It's something God has declared over your life, and nothing can change that status or your position in Christ. It is who you are as a child of God by his grace. That is positional sanctification. There's also what is known as progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification, the other side. Um, And uh, that's, uh, pardon me, in order to define what we mean by progressive sanctification, I wrote this down and it will be up on the screen. Uh, This is what we're after today, this side of sanctification, progressive sanctification. It is the process by which the believer, having been justified, grows in holiness through the power of God's spirit and the grace of his word, thereby becoming more like Jesus. Sanctification is the process by which the believer, having been justified, grows in holiness through the power of God's spirit and the grace of his word, thereby becoming more like Jesus. Maybe to say it another way, and we know that sanctification is in fact happening in our lives when we look like le- we look less like who we were before we came to know Christ, and we look more like him now that we know him as Lord and Savior. That is, for the Christian, we ought to look less like who we were in Adam and daily look more like Jesus in our daily lives. And so you might have a story like that. Um, You know, what was your life like before you came to know the Lord? You were dead in your sins and trespasses. Sin was just normal to you. It didn't really seem all that, you know, uncommon to just be sinning, 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 sinning. And then God revealed the grace of the gospel in Christ to you. And you said, I don't want that anymore. Sin, which once looked so tempting and good to me, now it repulses me. And I want to grow into holiness in Christ Jesus. I long to obey him. I long to know him. I want to know his word. I want to obey his word. I don't look like who I was before I came to know Christ. I look more like him now that he is my Lord and Savior. That's the process of sanctification. And I think it's very important to know that Jesus didn't die just to save you. He died also to change you. Um, 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that, having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. Knowing Jesus in a saving way changes us. And how that change happens is what we're after for the next two weeks. And let's start here today by looking at verse 10 of Philippians chapter 3. Look with me at the very first part of verse 10 in Philippians 3. God's word says, Paul writes here, My goal is to know him, that is Christ, and the power of his resurrection. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection. Considering the joy of sanctification or being made more like Christ, when I know Jesus in a saving way, note this first thing, it's our first point today if you're taking notes. Number one, I am filled with a new power. I am filled with a new power. My goal is to know him, Paul says, a point we concluded with last week. And then look at what the text says. And the power of his resurrection. The word translated power 
is the Greek word dunamis there. It's actually in the family tree of words from, what we get, uh, from which we get our modern word dynamite. And because of this, it's not uncommon that you'll hear pastors and teachers say, isn't that incredible? The resurrection power that we have inside of us is like dynamite. And it seems to preach well, but it's actually quite irresponsible with the text of Scripture when we conclude things like that, and here's why. Dynamite is a rather modern invention. Um, it's a controlled form, a stabilized form of nitroglycerin, which was created in 1867 by Alfred Nobel. Because of this, because it was created in 1867, there is no possible way that Paul, writing around the year 60 AD, had any concept of dynamite whatsoever. Um, so saying that the power of Christ's resurrection is similar to the explosive power of dynamite is actually what is called an anachronism. That is, attributing a custom act or event to a period which it doesn't belong. So Paul couldn't have possibly had modern dynamite in mind when he was writing this verse. Rather, I think he had something or someone far more powerful in mind. One that makes dynamite when compared to the power he's speaking of look like one of those little snapping pops that kids throw down on the ground at the 4th of July. Uh, outside of our front door around the 4th of July, there's all these little white pieces of, of garbage um, because it's fun. It's pop, 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 you know, and as you get older, sometimes you try to throw them at each other and it, you know, it's fun, but it's also not safe. But the power Paul is speaking of here far exceeds that of any dynamite. The power of Christ's resurrection. Scripture has much to say about the power that raised Jesus from the dead. As a matter of fact, it is the very power of the one who can speak the universe into existence out of nothing. The very power of God himself. Scripture teaches that the resurrection of Christ was a Trinitarian act. The Father, Son, and Spirit were all involved in this event, Galatians 1.1 teaches that the Father raised Christ from the dead. John 2, 19 through 21 teaches that the Son himself raised himself from the dead. Romans 8.11 says that the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. As it relates to the resurrection, it was a Trinitarian event. God the Father, Son, and Spirit were instrumental in the most significant event in all of human history. But I want to focus on Romans 8, 11, as it relates to our progressive sanctification this morning. Romans 8, 11 says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. If you are a Christian, God the Holy Spirit lives in you. He dwells in you. The power of the resurrection, which Paul speaks of in Philippians 3, verse 10, lives in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, you have all of the Holy Spirit, and he lives in you to powerfully transform you more into the likeness of Jesus. So this process of becoming holy this progress of sanctification in your life, this working out of your salvation in fear and trembling that Paul spoke of in chapter 2, verse 12, is something that is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God living in you, living in me, the believer in Christ. Now, the question is, how does the Holy Spirit of God, residing in the believer in Christ, carry along this process or the progress of sanctification? I wrote down four things. This is how the Spirit changes us day to day. Number one, the Holy Spirit of God convicts us of sin. The Spirit convicts us of sin. John 16, 8 says when he comes, that's the Spirit, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Perhaps you've experienced the convicting grace of the Holy Spirit. You recognize that's what he does. He gives us grace when he convicts us of sin. 
It's that, that prick that you feel in your conscience when you've done something and you know that it wasn't right. You know that what you did has broken God's law. You know that the action, the thought, the deed, whatever it was, violated the good commandments of God and you feel that in your heart. Sometimes we can look at that and we're like, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to sense that. I don't want to experience that. But understand something. When we feel those things as Christians, that is the grace of God extended to our lives by the Holy Spirit. God loves us too much to see us stay the way that we are. His good will for us is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. And so when you feel that, don't harden your heart as the Israelites did in the day of rebellion. Say, thank you, God, for convicting my mind and my heart that I've done something wrong. And then in view of the grace of Christ and the righteousness that is yours in him, repent, turn, confess, and move forward in holiness. One of the most terrifying things for the believer in Christ would be to do something that would be sinful and not care and not feel and not sense that what I've done has grieved the Spirit of God has sinned against the Almighty. It would be a terrifying thing to confess Christ as Savior and be able to sin and not care. I don't know if that would be entirely possible. So when the Spirit of God convicts you, say thank you. Don't run away from it. It's God's grace to you to change you more into the image of Jesus. Conviction is is not condemnation. The enemy, when we sin, would want to tell us you are unworthy. You guilty, wretched, filthy sinner. There's no way God could ever want you or accept you. Or if you were one of his children, you certainly aren't anymore because of what you've done. That's not the voice of the spirit. That's the voice of the enemy. But Romans 8.1 says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we respond to the voice of the enemy saying, praise God, Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And we press in to the convicting ministry of the spirit. We repent of sin and we move forward. The spirit of God convicts us of sin. Number two, the spirit of God points us to Jesus. The spirit points us to Jesus. This is how he changes us. This is how he brings along the process of sanctification. John 16, 14, Jesus says of the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me. That is the spirit of God will glorify point you toward, make your eyes gaze upon Jesus. That is his ministry. So many people in denominations are after an experience with the Spirit of God. And often, it's equated to some ecstatic, emotional response. Yet Jesus tells us that the Spirit's ministry isn't to whip up some sort of ecstatic emotionalism. The Spirit himself points us to Jesus And so we know as followers of Christ that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we are having an experience with the Holy Spirit, not when we're, as you might see on TV, shaking and laughing uncontrollably uncontrollably on the ground or running up and down the aisles in mass confusion. The scripture says that God is not the author of confusion. And actually the scripture speaks against chaos in the gathered worship service in a way that says that shouldn't ever happen. Because what if an unbeliever were to come in and see this mess happening. God is not the author of confusion. The spirit rather, he points us to Jesus. And so when our hearts and our minds and our lives and our affections are heightened for Jesus, that is the Holy Spirit of God working in you. He points us to Jesus. Number three, the spirit instrumentally puts sin to death. The Spirit instrumentally puts sin to death. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 says, So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. John Owen famously said, Be killing sin.'" 
or sin will be killing you. As Christians, we, by the power of the Spirit, are continually not merely to be struggling with sin, but putting it to death. How do we do that? How do we do that? Sanctification is war on sin by the power of the Spirit. Do you, do you look at sin in your life that way as a follower of Christ? It's not like, ah, well, yeah, that's like pretty much everybody kind of has that struggle going on, so, you know, it's not that big of a deal for me either. Or when you notice in your heart that envy creep up or that lust begin to flourish or greed tighten its grip, is your response like, oh, yeah, everybody kind of, everybody, everybody gets that? Or is it, it's war? I will kill you by the power of God's Spirit so that my mind and my heart will be brought more into conformity with Christ Jesus. There is no place for you here, lust. There is no place for you here, greed, envy, malice, murder, or strife. I am not dead in my sin any longer. I am alive with the resurrection power of Christ living in me by the Spirit, and therefore I will put to death the deeds of the body. Sin will no longer reign over me. Indeed, it does not. Sin has no power over you if you are in Christ. Therefore, you can put to death sin by the power of the Spirit in your life. The Spirit often acts like a flashlight in our lives, and he will shine his light into the deepest, darkest corners of your mind and of your heart. And he will expose in his convicting grace the sin that yet still remains. And one of the last things we want to do in that moment, it's, I read it just a moment ago, confessing our sins to one another. If you keep that hidden, like we bought this house 12 years ago on Oneida Street. It was our first home. It was a small home. And it was great for us when we first started there. And as we went to that house, um, I don't know when the last person had lived in it before we came, um, but we went down into the basement. And it was finished. And it was dark. And it was damp. And as we turned the lights on, I walked down there like, oh, this is nice. It's a finished basement. This is cool. And like, there was a couch sitting along the wall. And I turned the lights on. I'm like, that couch has fur. Couches aren't supposed to have fur. Like, that fur is mold. And that environment, that deep, dark, still, unoccupied basement with the lights turned off and no one ever going down there was the perfect environment for this mold to grow and to infest that entire basement. Sin will be the same in your heart if you keep the lights off and you try to ignore it. It won't go away on its own. You cannot defeat it by yourself. But confessing it, getting it out into the light is one of the best ways to kill sin. And one of the ways the enemy would want you to keep it in the dark is he's going to try to convince you that the struggle of, with sin that you have right now, you're the only person dealing with it. And if anybody else were to know the sin that yet remains in your heart and my heart, they would be shocked. I'm telling you as a pastor, people have told me things that they've done, that they are dealing with, that are still in their lives, expecting me to be like, what? Are you kidding me? And I was like, there's no temptation that has seized you except that which is common to man. Like, you didn't surprise me. You didn't shock me. Like, you are a person who's on the road to holiness, battling sin that so easily entangles. But keeping it in the dark Keeping it in that damp basement is only going to allow it to grow. And so how that story ends, though, with the house is that I was like, we're not buying this house if all this mold's in the basement. So you got to mitigate the mold. And so they mitigated the mold. But I, again, rookie mistake, the first house we ever bought. We went in there after we signed the papers and closed on the house. And I went down to the basement. And it was once a finished basement with a bunch of mold. Now it was just simply an unfinished basement with no mold. So we lost all that. So if that ever happens to you, like mitigate the mold and put the basement back to the way that it was, right? So um, either way, don't allow your sin to stay in the dark. It will only grow and get stronger. Bring it into the light. The Spirit of God kills sin in us as we bring it into the light. Fourth and finally, the Spirit seals us 
for the day of redemption. The Spirit seals us for the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 says, You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, He has also put his seal on us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a down payment. The Spirit in us guarantees that the believer will ultimately progress toward the likeness of Christ. We are faithfully preserved as we seek to be like Christ, and we will finally be perfected in holiness at the return of Jesus Christ. Our progress in sanctification is empowered by the Spirit of God living in us. So rely on his power as you and as I strive for holiness in the fear of the Lord and for our joy in Christ. Now, as we continue, Paul goes in a direction that is inevitable in a fallen world. One that is uncomfortable for us, but one that is by the absolute sovereignty of God ordained for our good. Look what Paul says here at the end of verse 10. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Write this down. The second point as it relates to the joy of sanctification. Number two, I realize a new purpose in suffering. I realize a new purpose in suffering. The fellowship of his sufferings is a bit of a peculiar phrase. The NIV actually translates it there, participation in his sufferings. The ESV says that we may share his sufferings. The New Living Translation says, I want to suffer with him. As we get at the meaning of this phrase, we need to be clear about what it does not and cannot mean and then focus on what it does mean. As it relates to the suffering of Jesus, the suffering he endured for the salvation of sinners like you and me, this, by the way, is what Paul spoke of back in chapter 2, verse 8, saying that Christ was obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. The historical event of the crucifixion is not something that we participate in. Nor is it an act, nor is that act of crucifixion something that is repeated or perpetuated as the Roman Catholic Church believes. Rather, the suffering that Jesus experienced in the historical act of the crucifixion was a unique event that accomplished the salvation of his people. It is done. It is finished, Jesus says. Romans 6.10 says, For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. Hebrews 9.28 says, So also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. So what does it mean that we know the fellowship of his sufferings? Paul here speaks of believers identifying with Jesus in the sufferings that he endured. And as we understand and view the sufferings that we experience in light of the suffering that Jesus our Lord endured before us, it allows us to see suffering as being filled with purpose in at least two very significant ways. Number one, the suffering we endure as Christians is a powerful witness for Jesus in the gospel. The suffering that we endure as Christians, is a powerful witness for Jesus in the gospel. We know that we will face trial, tribulation, hardship, and suffering in this life. This is part and parcel of a fallen world. Jesus himself said in John 16, you will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. As Christians, we know that suffering will come. Even so, we know that God is in control. He is sovereign over everything that comes into our lives, as the book of Job testifies. There is purpose behind everything that occurs in your life because God is absolutely sovereign. And that's a hard truth to embrace for sure. Professor and commentator Scott Haifman offers a helpful perspective relating to this. He says, we must resist limiting God's sovereignty in the face of suffering. The comfort of God is not his empathy with us as someone who feels the tragedy of evil but is helpless in it, nor does the comfort of God reside in his actions as a, quote, fourth quarter quarterback who's brought in just after things have fallen apart to save the day just before the whistle blows. 
Haifman says there is no comfort in suffering if God is not sovereign over it. To pare down God's sovereignty is to render suffering a triumph of evil and sin against the limited will and power of God. As followers of Jesus, we endure suffering sustained by the power of the Spirit in view of the truth that Jesus has conquered the world and his victory is sure. So, We have a great opportunity amid suffering to testify to Christ's faithfulness and God's sovereignty. We know that our suffering is only temporary and that it is not arbitrary, but it is an opportunity for the gospel to be proclaimed and Christ to be shown as powerful and faithful through it all. The second purpose of suffering in our lives is this. The suffering we endure as Christians serves to mold us into the likeness of Jesus. That is, it serves our sanctification. The suffering that we endure as Christians serves to mold us into the likeness of Jesus. It serves our sanctification. Look at the end of verse 10. Paul says that we are being conformed to his death. The word translated being conformed is a present passive participle. The school year just started. Welcome to English class. All right? It's important massively important, especially as we understand our sanctification. When a verb is in the passive voice, it means that the subject is not doing the action. Rather, the subject is being acted upon by another. In this case, namely, the Spirit of God. God purposes every moment of suffering in our lives to have a sanctifying effect upon us. Certainly, the hard moments in life provoke within us the question, why? Why, God? Why now? Why me? But we can know with absolute certainty that the answer to the why is not that God was unaware, not that God was lacking in power, not that God was unable to prevent the circumstance. Rather, we must as Christians in the strength that is ours by the Spirit of God, answer the why that we feel so deeply in two ways. This is how we answer. When we feel that, and feeling that is normal, feeling that makes sense in this world, but how do we answer it? How do we answer that question of why in the midst of suffering? Two things. Number one, with a question. How can I become more like Jesus through this trial? How can I become more like Jesus because I encounter this suffering in my life. Romans chapter five, verses three through five says, and not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. The hope will not, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This trial serves a purpose. This affliction is designed by God in his wisdom for me to make me more into the likeness of Jesus. How can I become more like Jesus through this trial? Number two, we answer the question why with a commitment. So one with a question, this with a commitment. The commitment is this. I will choose in view of this trial In view of my suffering, I will choose to find more satisfaction, joy, and comfort in Christ than if this trial, this moment of suffering, had not occurred. I will choose to find more satisfaction, joy, and comfort in Christ than if this trial, this moment of suffering, had not occurred. Remember Paul's response to the thorn he was given by God to keep him from becoming conceited. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, Paul says, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When peace, like a river, 
attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live, if dark hours about me shall roll, no pang shall be mine, for in death as in life thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. As we near the end of our text today, look with me at verse 11. God's word says in verse 11, Paul says, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Uh, Note this third thing. I have certain hope in an uncertain future. I have certain hope in an uncertain future. Future. Paul here is not so much saying that the certainty of his salvation is in question, but rather how he will arrive at the fullness of, of his salvation is unknown to him. Uh, the scriptures are abundantly clear that those who are truly in Christ cannot be and will not be finally lost, but will be raised up on the last day. Jesus spoke powerfully to this in John chapter 6, verses 37 through 40. Jesus says in verse 37 and following, everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus goes on to say in verse 44 of John chapter 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. If you have been drawn to Christ by the Father, the promise is that Christ himself will raise all of those who are drawn up. On the last day. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, In him, that is Christ, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance, Paul says, until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. The hope of final resurrection in Christ is certain for the believer. But we don't know what will happen between now and then. That's the somehow of verse 11. Presently, Paul is awaiting the verdict that will determine whether he lives or dies for the sake of the gospel. He doesn't know precisely what will transpire in the coming days, but he does know that through all the hardship, through all the trial, all the suffering and uncertainty, that God is in the process of doing a great work in his life, a work of sanctification that will change him, mold him, conform him into the likeness of Jesus. And it will be for his joy and for God's glory. If you are in Christ, that is also true of you today. Would you bow your head with me as we close? Before we pray, I want to consider the things that we've heard. The scripture does say, do not be conformed to the world. Don't be pressed into the mold of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As it relates to our sanctification, I want you to think about these things before the Lord. As it relates to our sanctification, What things are a part of your life right now that would be conforming you not more into the image of Christ, but would be conforming you to the world, pressing you into the mold of the world's system, making worldliness and sin seem normal and holiness weird? What's in your life that needs to be not in your life? What is not serving your holiness? What is not serving your sanctification? Ask God by his spirit to convict you of that in grace, to reveal it to your heart, that you would turn from it, that you would repent of it, 
that you would believe that Christ is superior to it and more satisfying than it. And then ask the Lord that he would help you understand in his wisdom and by his grace how even the most difficult circumstances in your life today are to be used to make you more like Jesus, to change you more into the likeness of Christ. God loves you. He is working all things together for your good. So may we, in view of his goodness and his grace and his power and his faithfulness, press on in sanctification toward holiness for our joy and for his glory. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are a God who has not left us the way that we are, but is changing us day to day more into the image of Jesus. And God, we long for, we, we await with great joy and expectation, even in trial, the day when we will see Jesus. And as the text of Scripture says, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Lord, we pray that by the grace of your spirit, you would sustain us for that day. We would rely on you. We would depend on you. We would worship you even through the difficulty because we know that you are working all things together for our good, that your grace is sufficient for us in trial, in suffering, in weakness. In fact, your power is made perfect in weakness. So may we, for the glory of Christ and the sake of the gospel, boast all the more in our afflictions so that the world would see the superiority of the life lived in Jesus and glorify you who is in heaven. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen.